Welcome to this Q&A video. Lots of questions from Patreon supporters and others covering a range of topics, so let's jump straight in. Okay, given the events of the last week, it's not a surprise we have a couple of questions on this topic. Being a non-partisan UK citizen and reflecting on the passing of Queen Elizabeth, which would be your top arguments for keeping and abolishing the British monarchy? And then also, what are your thoughts on the head of state role if Britain becomes a republic? Would be a ceremonial role or executive and elected or appointed? So look, nothing has quite illustrated how knotty a problem this is than the events of the last couple of weeks with the death of the Queen. I think there is an excellent case to be made that Queen Elizabeth was the best head of state the country could have asked for over the last few decades, maybe the best any country could have asked for, in that I'm not aware of any country you could point to where that role had been done better. What she brought over time was growing experience. She'd met all the world leaders, including a fair few of the rogues. She would endlessly ask them about their perceptions, impressions of each other and events and so on. And then she was able to meet privately with the prime minister and bring all of that growing knowledge and human wisdom to benefit their own reflections on what they might do without ever actually telling them what they should do, must do. Once you have a system of democratically elected heads of state, then they have a mandate to do more. Necessarily, they become partisan figures, and they also therefore become much shorter term figures. Because they get voted in, they get voted out. So I really do get the argument that the constitutional monarchy has demonstrated superior value over the last seven decades. But you have to avoid falling into the trap of thinking that a person is the same as a system. The flaw behind the monarchy is that there's zero choice. Some people were saying years ago they didn't like Charles. They thought the role should skip a generation and go straight to William. Well, did you notice? That didn't happen because what you think about it is not relevant. The system doesn't care. No, that's not entirely true. Queen Elizabeth adopted numerous times two waves of public sentiment. She certainly understood that if you fell too far out of step with the public, the system probably would not hold. So when Princess Diana died, the normal royal way of avoiding public displays of emotion provoked a huge backlash. So the Queen quickly decided to break with tradition and post a more personal message. And it worked. It won back some of the support which had begun seeping away. That suggests the system is vulnerable now. The first time you get to an incumbent without the skill to recognise what needs to be done or someone who simply doesn't have the qualities to win back the support of a modern society. So, does that strengthen the argument for hereditary monarchy or weaken it? You can kind of take it either way. The advantage of hereditary monarchy is you know well in advance who's next in line, as well as next after that, and they spend a lot of time being prepared to take the role. So by the time they do, they should have a lot of the skills and the experience that they need to do it well. The disadvantage remains what I said it was. You don't have a choice. How much time would King Harry need to become a good monarch? Sometimes people just don't cope with the weight of expectations and they simply fail. And then you have no system for getting rid of them. That's the other side of it. It's a brutal system to throw people into. The fact the Queen did such a good job of it rather masks the fact that being overanalyzed and gossiped about while you can't publicly respond, all of those things are actually really tough. So I'm really quite torn on this one. Could you have a similar figure in a republic? Someone who was appointed because of their experience and good standing with no real power save as a constitutional backstop should democratic systems fail? I guess the nearest thing to it I'm aware of is the Irish presidency. The president of Ireland is elected directly from the people for a seven-year term. He or she can run for just two consecutive terms. It's largely ceremonial office, except that the president acts as a key representative of the Irish state and acts as the guardian of the constitution. He appoints the government, accepts their resignations, as indeed the British monarch does. He doesn't have the right to refuse to appoint the nominated prime minister. The British monarch technically could. It would create an instant constitutional crisis if they did. 
But although they don't tend to be highly partisan divisive figures, the Irish presidents do tend to be politicians. So the current president, Michael D. Higgins, was a minister with the Labour Party. As president, he's focused on issues concerning justice, social equality, social inclusion, anti-sectarianism and anti-racism. The British monarch is expected not to promote causes, certainly not contentious, politicised ones. There is a big open question right now about whether Charles can restrain himself, having devoted his life to promoting various causes, including on climate change. Whether he will be accepted doing some of that, so long as it avoids any specific partisan elements? Could a system like the Irish one be tweaked to nudge it a little more into the non-political territory? I can't quite imagine it, but maybe. I don't know. Am I missing the ideal model that already exists in the world somewhere? If you think I am, let me know in the comments below. Next question. Have you ever been tempted, or done so, to stand for Parliament? I stood for Parliament in the 1992 general election. Now, this was back in the days when I was still with the Greens, so no likelihood of actually getting elected there. In fact, I stood in one of the six constituencies in Sheffield, and because I was a principal speaker with a party, I was put into the constituency that was going to be the tightest contest. So that was going to squeeze our vote more than the others, where they were mostly safe Labour seats. So I was guaranteed the lowest vote out of the six, the thinking was that because of the tightness, the contest would get all of the local media attention, which it did, and if I did well enough, then it might boost the performance of the other candidates. Bearing in mind, boosting performance in those days for the Greens might aspire to the giddy heights of actually saving your deposit, which you have to get 5% to do. Don't know whether I succeeded in that or not, because we can't rerun the election without me to find out. But that was all a very different time, a very different world, and certainly a very different Malin. Would I be tempted to stand for Parliament again now? No. The thing I learned by dallying with politics is that I'm not built for the partisan bunfest that you have to engage in to be successful in politics. I mean, it's good that some people do it, it's good that good people decide to do it, but you need qualities and skills different to the ones that I have. Or maybe I'm just too self-indulgent in being critical of any and all sides equally. Frame it how you like. I'm doing a YouTube channel where I'm trying to make a virtue of looking for the facts and going where they lead, regardless of who that pisses off. That suits my natural mindset. That's a mindset I would have to give up if I wanted to use the opportunity to actually get into politics seriously and make it a difference. Frankly, there's enough politicians trying to do what you have to do to be successful there. I'm seeing dishearteningly few people, I mean really, focused on a non-partisan take on the current changing world. There are some, some brilliant people who I could only aspire to learn from, but few enough that I feel like I can make a contribution here if I can crack the code to make it of real value to people. Never say never, but that's how it looks right now. Depending on who you listen to, nuclear power is either the cheapest or the most expensive way to generate electricity. What is the truth? People get confused about this because it's the most expensive to build. A lot of the cost of nuclear is front-loaded because it costs a huge amount to build a modern large-scale nuclear power plant compared to anything else. So if you're only thinking relatively short term, you see that big price tag, you're tempted to go elsewhere. But if you're costing energy sources long term, which you really should be if you're a responsible government, then the fact the stations last for a number of decades and have very reliable always on power makes them a lot cheaper in terms of the overall comparison. With third generation plants, you also need to factor in another chunk of cost at the end with a decommissioning. And of course, you then have radioactive waste that may need to be monitored for as long as the human race has been around so far, which is quite an awesome commitment. Fourth generation plants promise to solve some of those problems, especially on the waste side. But in the short term, because they are the first instance of the technology, those costs will be higher. The cost of that technology will fall if and when it gets pushed to scale. But the point really is that all energy forms have pluses and minuses, so it's not the case that you get a single one that is the cheapest and when you just build all of your energy supply onto that one source. 
while cost is important, obviously, we shouldn't assume that the cost, short or long term, is the sole factor, or indeed that it stays the same, as we found with gas. Some things, particularly in terms of reliability and security of supply, may be worth paying a little more for. And as some technologies get introduced and pushed to scale, the relative cost will change. And that will certainly happen several times over during the lifetime of a nuclear power station. Would you be interested in assessing the argument of Alex Epstein, Fossil Future, why global human flourishing requires more oil, coal and natural gas, not less? I doubt it from what I've seen. You see, my perception is that Alex Epstein is, if you like, the mirror image of Extinction Rebellion people. Both of them put forward some true things, then a few things stretched beyond their context, and then they cover all of that with a huge dollop of moralising and value judgement. So XR people point to some true facts about climate research, upon which we could agree. Then they stretch some of the outlier stuff into catastrophizing, which I don't see holding up under scrutiny of current evidence. Then they dollop on morality to the degree where fossil fuels become a moral bad. Which means that even if your net zero plan inevitably and necessarily continues to involve fossil fuels over the next couple of decades, albeit on a taper, they will look at every instance of sourcing those fossil fuels and push for them to be shut down. Because morality, not practicality. Now, as sign from what I've seen, and I may be wrong because I haven't read his books, but I assume his debate arguments represent his work accurately, Epstein again say some things that are true. Fossil fuels are a fantastic energy source, energy dense, highly portable. That's why humanity's been able to ascend into an astonishing technological reality from the time of the Industrial Revolution. Again, we agree. And I've said all of those things in the video I did about the history of fossil fuels and why if we had to leave them behind in an orderly and well-managed way, we should be waving them a grateful farewell. They served humanity really well. I think he then stretches some other things, downplaying the implications of the solid climate research, exaggerating into straw men the arguments of some of his opponents. And then like XR, he dollops a bunch of morality on top of it and says things like it would be immoral and even evil to be moving away from fossil fuels at all. I think any argument that projects morality onto energy sources is a dumbed down argument. Energy sources have pros and cons. We could be pragmatic about what energy mix would serve our interests best, how quickly and in what fashion and order we should move towards change. All of that can be a relatively useful discussion, but it should be boring. Talking about the energy mix of your country's infrastructure should be practical and boring to anyone but an engineer. Yet we now have tribes who root for their energy sources, sometimes even make stuff up to support it. It makes zero sense, the same as tribes having their favourite medical treatments, for goodness sake. I mean, seriously, what on earth is this place we've arrived at? Anyway... Things that were previously the preserve of experts who judged which things practically work to solve problems. It's now become all ideological. So if Alex Epstein had just made the case that the pragmatic mix was not how some people are seeing it, it was a solid case for a different mix or a slower transition, I would be perfectly interested in that. I tend to assume it will take longer than people think anyway, just because most things do. But because he's doing the whole morality thing, the moral case for fossil fuels, how moving away from fossil fuels would be evil, I'm not especially attracted to analysis on that basis. Now, of course, if you transition energy sources badly, it could have evil consequences, like keeping people in poverty without reliable energy. That's a problem that's entirely solvable should we apply ourselves. It's not an interesting discussion. Fossil fuels evil. Moving away from fossil fuels evil. No and no. Grow up. Maybe that's being too quick to come to a conclusion based on a first impression. If you think my perception of his argument is wrong, give me the bullet list of what I missed in the comments below. Maybe I'll think again. I haven't looked at the detail of what he says. I'm not trying to straw man his argument. But don't just tell me that you think I should look again and read his books, unless you can give me a solid example as to why I'm getting him wrong. When does a study or thread of research become viable to become worthy of using as the basis for implementing policy? That doesn't strike me as the sort of question where it's helpful to overgeneralise. 
It depends on the size of the risk that would be involved. It depends on the cost and the consequences of taking action versus the cost and the consequences of not taking action. Obviously, if taking action involves zero cost or inconvenience, then a simple balance of probabilities would be enough. Bear in mind that if it leads into a direction that people find to be contentious, and what doesn't these days, then as far as the people who don't agree are concerned, the bar could never be high enough. Demanding a high burden of proof for your opponent's case, while of course totally accepting a lower one for your own side, that is a standard pattern of behaviour right now. So if you're generalising on such a question, you have to have a system robust enough to stand up in the face of that, to bring in some objectivity. On climate change, if that's what we're talking about, I think that a likelihood of high impact, supported by multiple strands of research and wide agreement across the specialist science community, I mean, on any topic that wasn't contentious, I think that would be accepted without question. With climate, though, the complication really is that the nature of the response is highly political. The types of policies put forward by activists and politicians can be sometimes at least criticised as ideological, not pragmatic. Also, there are powerful players with a vested interest in the status quo who have undoubtedly acted to stoke uncertainty for their own short-term benefits. So then you have a different calculation, the risk and potential harm from unintended consequences of bad policy, and the risk that a real problem becomes harder to agree because of undeclared vested interests. If you ignore a real problem because of misinformation, you could suffer grievously for it. However, if you respond to a real problem with ill-conceived policy that will make things worse, not better, for whatever reason, then obviously you want to have a very robust process of scrutiny for whether policy gets accepted. Unfortunately, because we're all tribal these days, the debate on that is remarkably unfruitful. And that's the problem. We need credible people who look at what some of the ideologues put forward that can call out fuzzy thinking and massive cost underestimates and all of those things that politicians sometimes do. But if the only people we've got issue their challenge on the basis of pretending there's no problem at all, then they don't meet the threshold of credibility and they don't add anything to the process. So I think the research on climate has certainly long passed the threshold of using as a prompt for formulating policy. What uncertainties remain there are points of detail, not a substance, but it doesn't become the basis for implementing policy. Because while the science can tell you what policy goals you might have, net zero emissions for instance, it doesn't tell you what policies you should use to get there. Policies involve trade-offs, they have to be supportable long term within democratic systems, else they'll be abandoned. And they have to deal with multiple goals, not just the single variable. And the fact most activists think that if you accept the science, then somehow it points inexorably and exclusively to their preferred policy choices, that's where we have the serious mismatch. That leads neatly onto a policy question. On the surface, the proposal to restart fracking in the UK seems like a reasonable proposal for helping with ongoing energy security while we transition to nuclear and renewables. I am keen to understand if fracking could be online quickly enough to be of use while we transition. Is it likely to have a negative impact on the country's CO2 production and what other environmental impacts could it have? Can you help? I'm not an expert on fracking. I've not researched it in detail. Maybe I should do a video to do just that, given that it's coming down the pipeline, as it were. I may well do that. My understanding today is that it would make some contribution to a degree of energy security for a minority but substantial percentage of our gas requirements over the coming decades. It wouldn't have a negative impact on our CO2 emissions unless we decided that, for some reason, we were going to use more gas in the run-up to 2050 than we previously said we were going to. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we did, just because change is harder in the real world than it is on paper, but not because fracking specifically becomes one of the sources for that gas. But this again is one of those areas where ideology is in evidence. It seems to me at a time of energy crisis and medium term energy transition, you want all of the things. You would want locally sourced oil and gas where you could get it. You would want renewables where they work. You would want more battery storage and hydrogen production. You would want more nuclear power stations. You would want to promote more home and building insulation to reduce energy demand. 
Getting the mix of those should be a practical exercise, as I said before, an engineering task of weighing pros against cons, things that can come on stream relatively short term versus things that will provide best value long term. All of it. But one side just wants to build wind turbines and solar panels and the insulation and the other side apparently just wants oil and gas and nuclear and some of that gas via fracking. So long as that's the case, you fear that ideology, not pragmatism, is making the decisions and that's a bit disappointing given the nature of the problem that we're having. Back to your question, whether fracking can come on stream fast enough to help short term, the government has said that it thinks it could start within six months. General principle, these things always run later than politicians say they will. Let's call that 12 months. No use whatsoever with the current energy crunch. We have to hope for global gas prices to decline rather than continue to go up. An outcome that I have been hearing the first optimistic noises about, although by no means certainty. But medium term, it can make a contribution, assuming the downsides, which we've not discussed in detail here, don't end up ruling it out. And the point is, you shouldn't keep putting off things that have medium term impact. Some of you will have heard the video footage of former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg talking about how nuclear power wasn't any kind of solution because it wouldn't be on stream until about 2020. Thanks, Nick. Why don't we ever learn from history? In the 30s, we sought to appease the despot Hitler. Today, many are suggesting we appease Putin. In terms of your specifics, I completely agree. I do think that history supports the view that if you reward predatory behaviour on the world stage, you will get more such behaviour, not less. In terms of a generality, I sound one note of caution. Generally, history has many examples of things that go one way and many other things that go the exact opposite way. There are contextual and detailed reasons for the differences, but it does make it rather easy for people to draw whatever lessons from history they want. You can probably find some example that gives any predetermined wisdom the smack of authenticity. I mean, you could go back to the times of Genghis Khan and note that the cities that surrendered quickly to the Mongol hordes were often treated relatively well, while those who fought were slaughtered mercilessly. You could draw from that that when a powerful neighbour attacks, you should recognise when you're outgunned, concede quickly and gracefully. We would say, well, sure. If you're happy to live in an ugly, might-makes-right world where big players just take whatever they want, but then that's the world Putin believes in and wants Russia to be dominating once again. So yes, he can draw his lessons from history just as much as we can. I do think we can learn from history. I just think we need to do it with more attention to the detail and caution than people tend to bring to it. Could someone say in one minute why Netherlands hates nitrogen so much? Without justifying how they're going about addressing it, because I'm certainly not doing that, let's have a go. The Netherlands is a small, highly densely populated country, a huge amount of agriculture that exports a lot of food to the world. That means the impact of that production is concentrated into a small space. Nitrogen is a key nutrient for plants, but where it runs off into the environment, it's also a pollutant. In lakes and coastal areas, it creates algal blooms that kill marine life. Nitrous oxides from livestock, urine and manure react in the atmosphere to form aerosols that damage foliage, cause acid rain, which acidifies the soil, which then isn't good for crops. Farmers in the Netherlands have to add significant quantities of lime to the soil to fight the resulting acidity. Is that a problem that requires you to shut down a third of your agricultural base? You would think there would be alternative approaches. But let's be grown up about it. No politician is going to voluntarily jump into that sort of hot water unless there's at least a real problem that needs solving. Are you concerned about the online safety bill? Toby Young says it's a huge blow to free speech, which is often a topic for you, but I don't remember you commenting on it. I did talk about it some time ago when it was still called the Online Harms Bill. So for others, this is a UK bill, but he's trying to reduce some of the negative impacts of social media. But of course, it's very hard to do that without those pesky unintended consequences. They framed this concept of things that social media companies should remove on pain of huge penalties, which is legal but harmful. 
When justifying it, they're talking about trying to protect, for example, vulnerable teenagers against things like self-harm and suicide content. But of course, then there's a lot of people who are only too aware of how every social justice warrior would define harm in a very different way and are worried that it would provoke social media companies keen to avoid those grievous penalties into being much more restrictive on anything controversial, just to be safe. Now, I haven't said much about that recently because there's been quite a bit of unease about the bill on the right of the Tory party, for obvious reasons, and there's now a new government, and there's been a lot of talk about how the bill should be and is likely to be fixed before it goes forward. Toby runs a campaigning free speech organisation, so of course he's being highly visible on how bad it could be. It'll be something he can claim as a campaign success if it's duly amended, so that's what you do as a campaigner. For me, I'm now waiting to see what actually comes out in the process, in reality. I think it's highly likely to be amended into a more neutered form. If not, you can certainly expect me to be covering it in the future. By the way, I can tell you another blow to free speech. This week we discovered that PayPal has cancelled the accounts of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young personally, and his Skeptics website. I expect I'll have more to say on that on Friday, but it seems like a highly aggressive move against an organisation that simply defends the right to free speech, regardless what the person concerned was arguing for or against. Hi Malin, you've stated a few times that most UK elections have been decided on competency. One leader was clearly more inept than the other and that decided things. Early days of course, but what are your impressions of Trust versus Starmer? As you say, early days, it clearly depends on the next couple of years. Liz Truss has the opportunity to impress the country by showing she can get a grip, which would be quite a strong contrast to the chaos that came before. If she does that, she may well win enough support to hold the line, although she won't get anything like the majority that Boris Johnson got at the point where the country was reacting strongly against a parliament that had been trying to thwart the 2016 Brexit referendum. And that's an open question. She hasn't had any time as leader yet. When Margaret Thatcher first became leader of the Tory party, nobody had an inkling of a leader she was going to become. However, if perceptions don't change, then we end up with two candidates, both of whom come across as relatively underpowered. This has happened before. John Major versus Neil Kinnock, second time round, was a case in point. That particular election behaved differently with a lot of uncertainty as to who would win, Labour apparently ahead most of the time, but then right at the last minute it switched and elected John Major with a very narrow majority. If Truss fails to impress, we could well end up with another hung parliament. Only this time the Liberal Democrats would be highly resistant to forming a government with the Conservatives because their party got trashed in the aftermath of the last time they did it. And then you get the question of whether Labour does a deal with the Scottish Nationalists with the obvious price tag that they would want to bring, which Labour would probably be very reluctant to pay, since if you remove Scotland from the UK, you pretty much guarantee Conservative majorities from that point onwards. Of course, Liz Truss could go the opposite way and do so badly the country turns against her, thereby delivering Labour its first majority since Tony Blair. The thing is that Blair's front bench looked like a government in waiting. This one doesn't, although it's better than it was. So I don't think that it forms a majority. Interesting times, for sure. Hi, Malin. Lately, you've taken to confidently predicting imminent civil war in the USA. Do you mean this metaphorically? Is the UK headed in the same direction? It's not quite right. I've certainly said that the US has largely worked its way into the civil war mindset and the potential critical inflection point is looming with the 2024 election, depending on who stands and how it goes. I also said this problem will only be resolved either by civil war or by a similar political conflict. It doesn't have to be war. Maybe an attempt to succeed by a group of states. Maybe a constitutional crisis that leads to the rapid rise of a third political force. Various things that could happen. But you'd expect that civil war mindset isn't just going to melt away. It has to be some form of conflict and resolution to create a new political settlement. A new constitutional understanding of something that is built on common values or else the country finally splitting into two. I mean, if the states held a referendum 
and voted by a significant majority to succeed, then presumably that is what would happen. But look, you have a real danger point coming. Trump's rejection of any election but doesn't have him winning is poisonous to the democracy. The fact that he's been filling various candidacy and official posts with people who are likewise declaring their faith in the stolen election narrative, that leads you into some very dark waters. And not necessarily because they do something nefarious, but maybe because the other side becomes convinced that they did do something nefarious, and therefore they become the election deniers. Once trust collapses in the system... The system can't stand for long. What happens in your country if there's that total collapse in the system? If it doesn't gravitate to civil war, it certainly doesn't end well. But the shock of seeing how close it is might well shake people awake. I mean, let's hope so, because you won't like how the world looks once the dust has cleared after your civil war. There's a bunch of people poised to take advantage of your distraction to build a world order that suits them better and you probably not at all. Now enough people know that. Hopefully it'll mean that you avoid diving into the precipice. Will it happen in the UK? No. We have some polarisation, nothing on the same scale. Our institutions are stronger. I mean, we've just been renewing everyone's commitment to the unwritten constitution with a 10-day obsession session. We might see conflict, for sure. Riots based on energy crises and inflation. We've seen such things before. But not civil war, no. You're going to have that one all to yourself. Has the civil service really not been doing what the government have been asking them, or is this just a misdirection by a failing government? This is referring to a degree of pushback against the UK civil service by right-leaning politicians within the Conservative Party. The civil service is supposed to be politically neutral, dedicated to turning into reality whatever the policies are that the governing party puts forward. The mark of professionalism is meant to be civil service neutrality. Now, of course, large bureaucracies tend to be inefficiency, internal politics covering their backs. Human beings will also have their own preferences and more enthusiastically execute some projects than others. So how much politicians can command the respect and loyalty of the civil servants is always a key question for any government. If politicians are inept or they so distrust their own civil servants they treat them badly, they can end up floundering and unable to get things done. But if, on the other hand, they're too on side with their civil servants, they can end up being co-opted by them into doing whatever the officials think must be done. They end up being the cover for what is actually unaccountable power. I would expect the truth is that there are some important instances where civil servants have been obstructive. Very few of them by all reports were brought into Brexit, for instance. Plenty felt strongly enough about it that it would have tested their commitment to civil service neutrality. So you could make a case why government might want to shake things up a bit, remind people that they're there to serve government, not the other way round. But again, if they do that badly or if they hit random targets and take out good, experienced people for no good reason, then that could easily have the opposite impact. The point is that this is one of those areas where people on both sides will make claims to support them that we outsiders can't verify at all. So most people will just presume their side are right and they will support whatever they propose to do. I do think there's a strong argument that government bureaucracy has become too big, too bloated, slow to move, very inefficient. And there's no way to address that in a way that isn't going to hack off a bunch of civil servants in the process. I think it's too early though to suggest that it could be the government trying to distract attention from its own failings. Because it's a brand new government. Mostly new ministers. They will be coming in brimming with confidence that this is their time. Everything's going to get better from here. Bless them. They'll learn soon enough. Okay, last question. As regards the topic of a cold winter, 
Are we really at such a low level of meteorological science that we cannot forecast that the upcoming winter will be X relative to the average, with at least, let's say, a 75% confidence? I fully get that it's hard to accurately predict short-term weather such as tomorrow and next week because of the micro-specificity that it entails, but surely a more meta-level four-month period such as November to February is within our grasp. If our ability for medium term is not very strong, how is it that the longer term climate models have so much reliability to them? Because you can't conflate specific weather events with general climate trends and looking to a four month period is still doing the former and not the latter. Let me put it this way, an analogy, because the comment section always loves those. If you have a hundred coins and you toss each coin writing down the result, we all know that you will have a 50-50 chance of predicting correctly what each individual coin toss will be. That's the short-term problem. That's for weather. Now, what you're suggesting is akin to saying, well, all right, but surely if we're going to toss all 100 of these coins, then we should better be able to predict what coin number 40 will be. Obviously not. It's still 50-50, exactly the same as with the first coin. Now, those long-term climate models, they're not predicting an individual coin toss. They're effectively saying, if you're going to toss 100 coins, then they're going to trend towards 50 heads and 50 tails may not be exactly that after 100, but the more coins you toss, a 1,000, 100,000, the more it will trend to 50-50. Now, suppose you remove two of those coins and replace them with double-headed coins. Now, the longer term will trend towards a 51-49 split between heads and tails. Does that mean we can, with confidence, predict the next toss? No, the odds for that have changed to such a minuscule degree. We still can't do that but those averages are going to have subtly shifted. Now, this should be obvious if you look at the details of what affects the climate. To predict what the weather's going to be in four months' time, you need to know all sorts of things, including will there any volcanoes have gone off in that time, because they have a major impact on the climate. Will there have been the development of an El Nino or La Nina in the meantime? They have a major impact. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, how about the polar vortex where cold air gets displaced from the poles down towards Europe and North America? We've had a couple of those recently in the UK, first of which was labelled as the beast from the east. We often don't see those coming more than a few weeks in advance. So how would you possibly account for those in four months' time? But you can still look at how a certain amount of average global warming will affect trends. More heatwave extremes, more intense downpours with risks of floods. You just can't tell which years and which exact locations that will happen in. Just as you know, there will be roughly 50 heads and 50 tails, but you can't guarantee which froze will be which. All right. Thanks to all of you for your questions, especially Patreon supporters. If you'd like to get the chance to add your questions to next month's Q&A, you can become a supporter for as little as $5 a month. And that helps me to make these videos happen. Either way, see you on Friday for a news roundup for what seems to be a rather news packed week. See you then. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.